Is there really a turn or return to God in the 21st century? Or is this more a product of wishful thinking on the part of religious leaders and the establishment? Are the religious hierarchies in step with the enormous changes taking place at very rapid rate? The global village, the presence of technology in almost every part of our lives, the social networks, the ease of assessing information, whether good or bad, a world where anyone with a camera, basic computer literacy, and charisma can set himself or herself up as a prophet, a leader of a new religion or spiritual path, a messiah or preacher of the fast approaching apocalypse. These are just a few of the challenges which organized religions and their establishments face. Is there a case to be made, perhaps, that God needs to be marketed better? Success in today's world seems to be a function of marketing. If in academia we talk about public, pu uh, publish or perish, if you want to be noticed or taken seriously, if you want to get likes, you have to market yourself and you have to put enormous amount of energy into the packaging. About 3.2 million people have liked a Facebook page entitled God. I wonder who opened and who owns the page. Right. Around 90 million people like and follow Leo Messi, right? a demigod on the football pitch. And by the way, someone who wears his faith openly on his sleeve, as can be seen whenever he scores a goal. Yet, one is tangible, great to watch, and can be seen every day on the screen nearest you. The other is intangible, invisible, and hard to define. But the latter also needs good PR, needs representatives who can give him a good name. Take, for instance, Pope Francis, a man of 80 with enormous charisma, who in the simplicity of his way of life, his down-to-earth speech, his willingness to look at old concepts in new ways, his approachability and smile, is engaging hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of Catholics who are unhappy with the church they thought was totally out of touch with their spiritual and physical needs. Spiritual marketing at its best. However, on the other hand, significant elements of church doctrine have not changed, nor have they been adapted to meet the expectations and desires of perhaps many believers. And there are good reasons for this that stem from thousands of years of religious tradition, interpretation, and understanding of divine revelation, which, is, which does not allow for rapid change nor does it welcome it. There's also a great reluctance on the part of some of the religious hier hierarchies to move with the times. They would rather that religion remain constant, unchanging, a rock in a world of fluidity, mutability and secularism, an island of stability which promises eternal beatitude beyond the temporality of human life. Do religions need to engage with the world or should the world and society have to accept the principles and precepts of religion? Should religion remain aloof from the world, retaining its mystery, dogma, and praxis without any compromise? Or should religion be prepared to compromise and adapt itself in order to attract adherents and new believers? Should religion teach the world or learn from it? Should religion be focused on eternity and the world to come or on the travails, pains, and injustices of this world? Do those who represent God on earth need to be more user-friendly? Another way of looking at the issue of the turn or return to God in the 21st century is related to a basic human need which religion has fulfilled for, mil for millennia and which seems to be disintegrating before our eyes, a sense of belonging to a community. In a fast-changing world where one can don and discard identities, where the cult of the individual reigns supreme and individuality is idealized, the very fabric of community is threatened. Religions cannot survive without communities, and communities provide security, a safety net, and support systems for individuals. Religious belief and praxis can create a strong sense of belonging to something that gives meaning to the world around us. But the way communities are structured and run, who can be a member and who cannot, who is allowed a leading role and who is not, is something that is continuously being challenged and questioned. Is the concept of community something that has to be rethought 
if there is to be a return to God in the 21st century. Before they give their views and opinions on some of these issues, or others, whatever takes their uh, fancy, I would like to introduce our distinguished panelists. We've already been introduced to Cardinal Koch, President of the Pontifical Council for Promoting Christian Unity, President of the Commission of the Holy See for Religious Relations with the Jews, and the recipient of the Ladislao Latz Ecumenical and Social Concern Award here this afternoon. It seems to me that his experience and position make him eminently qualified to express an opinion on the topic before us today. Rabbi David Rosen hardly needs any introduction, but for the sake of a few here who might not have heard of him, he was the chief rabbi of Ireland. He is AJC, American Jewish Committee's International Director of Interreligious Affairs and Director of AJC's Halbrun Institute for International Interreligious Understanding. Rabbi Rosen is a member of the Chief Rabbinate of Israel's Committee for Interreligious Dialogue. He's an international president of the World Conference on Religion and Peace, honorary president of the International Council of Christians and Jews, and past chair of IJCIC, the International Jewish Committee for Interreligious Consultations. He is the only Jewish member of the Board of Directors of King Abdallah's International Center for Interreligious and Intercultural Dialogue established in 2012 by the King of Saudi Arabia, together with the governments of Austria and Spain with the support of the Holy See. In 2005, Rabbi Rosen received a knighthood from the Pope in recognition of his contribution to promoting Catholic Jewish reconciliation, and in 2010 he was awarded a CBE by Queen Elizabeth II. In 2016, he was awarded the Archbishop of Canterbury's Hubert Walter Award for Reconciliation and Interfaith Cooperation. And I can say as someone who follows him in Facebook, uh, around in Facebook, uh, you live up to your uh, uh, reputation. You're, you seem to be all over the place, all over the time, and we're delighted that you're here with us today. Rabbi Tamar Elad Appelbaum is the founder of Kehilat Zion Zion in Jerusalem and co-founder of the Bet Midrash for Israeli Rabbis, a joint project of the Hamid Rasha Educational Center for Israeli Judaism and the Shalom Hartman Institute. Her work spans and links tradition and innovation, working towards Jewish spiritual and ethical renaissance. She devotes much of her energy to the renewal of community life in Israel, interfaith work, and the struggle for human rights. Rabbi Tamar Elad Appelbaum served as the rabbi of Congregation Magen Avraham in the Negev, as a congregational rabbi in the New York suburbs alongside Rabbi Gordon Tucker, and as assistant dean of the Shechter Rabbinical Seminary in Jerusalem. In 2010, she was named by the Ford as one of the five most influential female religious leaders in Israel for her work promoting pluralism and Jewish freedom. Well, I'm going to ask each one of the panelists, starting with our distinguished guest, Professor, uh, Cardinal Koch, to uh, uh, talk about the topic in whatever way uh, they wish to do so. And following that, we'll uh, have some questions, answers, and we'll see, we'll see how, uh, uh, how it goes. So please, Cardinal Koch. Mr. Dean, dear rabbis, dear friends, having read the topic of our panel, my first idea was that God always was, is, and will be, and therefore there is no need to return to God. Because perhaps it has merely been the case that he was for a certain period absent on holidays, and therefore not reachable. In the book of Isaiah, God clearly states that he is always present, saying, I quote, I was ready to be sought by those who did not ask for me. I was ready to be found by those who did not seek me. I said, here I am I, here am I, to a nation that did not call on my name. Therefore, there is legitimate suspect that this is a matter of the human being having the impression that God is absent or he, she is refusing to seek him. When the Eternal One appeared in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush, he introduced himself to Moses as the one who is close to his people. I am who I am. He saw their affliction and heard the cry of his people oppressed by Egyptian slavery and was ready to intervene for them. So it seems merely to be the perception of the human being complaining about the absence of God 
and feeling abandoned by him. It seems that people of the modern era do not need a God when they are healthy. Everything works well and they can be masters of their own destiny. It is only in times of distress and affliction when human limits threaten their well-being that they seek help to implore in God. What are the challenges and fears in our societies in the beginning of the 21st century? When we look into the situation of the world today and allow ourselves to be moved by man's growing fear of current social and political developments, we encounter a growing egoism, a stronger nationalism, and an economic situation that has a, as its only goal the maximization of profits. The dramatic extent of fears become clearly visible when we take a brief look back into history and the evident trust expressed there in a better future of for, him, for humanity. Since war always means the defeat of humanity, since the end of the Second World War, the conviction that mankind must put an end to war has become entrenched in human thinking and is repeated endlessly as a litany. At the same time, the absolute priority of politics and diplomacy has been constantly stressed so that war can no longer be seen as it was previously as the continuation of politics by other means but must instead be condemned as the failure of politics. And in order to better secure world peace and more effectively prevent the escalation of violence and military conflict, people have set great trust in the creation of international law organizations. These have without doubt been the great achievement of humanity in the 20th century. At the beginning of the third millennium, however, these essential convictions seem to have been to a large extent forgotten and unlearned once more, as demonstrated not least by the terrible wars that have become the order of the day. But even the failure of politics and the powerlessness of international law are becoming, becoming increasingly apparent. Humanity has become all the poor through the loss of this great hope and its trust in a better future was suffered massive damage. In that we must perceive that the result, a creeping and increasingly manifest erosion of those fundamental human convictions we has, had hoped which would come to form an abiding good of humanity. The first decade of the new millennium has shown how brittle these convictions are. Military conflicts in so many troubled spots, appalling terrorism, massive migratory flows, and the global financial crisis confront us with major new questions. Above all, we find that many certainties that had previously sustained us have been put into question. We have had to discover that we can no longer rest assured of the political and economic certainties we had taken for granted. We have become insecure and vulnerable, and our trust in a positive future of humanity has been shaken to the core. Taking into account these developments, which have given rise to many new fears, we cannot ignore the question what can we still rely on in this world and what can we still trust? Developments in today's world are to be understood as signs of the times which urge and demand a response of faith. This response can only be, God is the only reality which the most terrible terrorism cannot destroy and which the greatest wealth in the world can neither buy nor sell. It is therefore fitting to seek and find new trust in God. If we commence to root ourselves in God, we certainly gain new confidence in the human being, who is called to live as the image of God 
in our world. In the same way, it is natural to respond to the globalization of the economy and the market in the contemporary world with the religious and ethical globalization of responsibility of love and love. Let's have a look at the biblical faith that differs from human trust in that it entrusts itself to the living God alone and relies solely on him. To take oneself outside of one's own hands and to allow oneself to fall utterly into the hands of another, it is ultimately possible only with God. Faith in the biblical sense is reliance and trust in God is that steadfastness in God with which man gains a firm hold of life, as the Protestant theologian Wolfgang Pannenberg rightly says. I quote, only trust in God fulfills the full sense of the biblical word faith. To what extent man is unable to live without faith and trust is evident from what he sets his heart on. And this is turn this in turn is revealed, for example, by what sacrifices he is prepared to make. Think of the victims of road accidents, the sacrifice states are willing to make in their wars, the sacrifice we humans demand in our exploitation of nature, or the everyday sacrifices we humans make in the name of power, honor, and prestige. God can obviously be given the most varied names in human lives. In my life, my God is precisely in that in which I ultimately place my trust and on which I set my heart. The German reformer of the 16th century, Martin Luther, gave a vivid example of this, I quote. Many a uh, one thinks that he has God and everything in abundance when he has money and possession. He trusts in them and boasts of them with such firmness and assurance as to care for no one. Lo, such a man also has a God, Mammon by name. Money and possessions on which he set all his heart and which is also the most common idol on earth. He who has money and possession feels secure and is joyful and in this made as though he were sitting in the midst of paradise. On the other hand, he who has no doubts and is despondent as though he knew of a new God. For very few are to be found who are of good cheers and who neither mourn or complain if they have not mammon. This care and desire for money sticks and clings to our nature even to the grave. So the quotation of Luther. This example has gained new currency in today's world, more than ever infected with a money-dominated pantheism, in which money has advanced to become an earthly god. This very example makes abundantly clear that the crucial difference on earth, a difference setting such a priority apart from biblical faith does not consist in the opposites of trusting or not trusting, nor even in the opposition of belief and unbelief, but much more radically in the opposition of God or idol, and thus of faith and superstition. The crucial question posed by biblical faith is the question, in what do we place our trust? In whom do we have faith? As people of faith, we rely on God to whom we are called because he has already called us to himself. Thank you. Well, with your permission, Cardinal Koch, and with the permission of other friends here, I want to share a few thoughts about this topic, about this issue, and say that in 1952, Martin Bubil came to New York. And he came deliberately, not long after the Holocaust, to warn the Jewish community that one of the deepest damages of the Holocaust was that it began the destruction of the human instinct of trust. Humans lost trust in themselves, in their communities, 
in humanity, in life, in God. Mankind after the world wars will slowly, he said, go into deep darkness. Many will accept loneliness as a brutal truth, maybe the only brutal truth, and see life as a mere jungle of survival. Bill came as a modern prophet to New York, warning from the flood of the 20th century, begging the faiths as ancient guardians of hope and trust to prepare themselves to be the only ark to survive that flood, begging that they maintain their human language of trust in God, but finally rejected by his own Jewish people. Yet Bubel was right. During the course of the 20th century, humans in the Western world slowly lost trust in themselves. It expedited the mode of survival among millions of people. Millions dreamed of saving their physical existence with disproportional wealth, dreamed of saving their souls by clothes, closing themselves in a room with their personal pain and a therapist away from the pain of the crowd, dreamed of saving their spirit by finding spiritual schools of solitude and serenity away from humankind and away from God. Common language was lost. Common stories were lost. Common good was lost. Tradition was lost. Trust was lost, flood. Now, I am no sociologist. I'm a rabbi of a little community in Yerushalayim in Jerusalem called Zion. And I stand at the head of the Israeli rabbinic seminary for rabbis from all denominations here in Israel. But being a rabbi in the past 20 years almost, I have seen the return to God in this century with my very own eyes. I witness it every day. And I ask myself over and over again, what was the gateway? In a short 15-page booklet published in 1949, on which I learned from my rabbi, who sits here, Rabbi Michael Gritz, Avraham Yoshua Heschel writes there about pikuach neshama. Pikuach neshama is saving of the soul. And he meant that one must save his soul. And yet I believe that what we are witnessing today is exactly the opposite. The soul is saving us. Our souls are saving us. Souls from God, saving humankind. Traversing the collapse of trust, knocking on our hearts and consciousness, demanding us to be removed from the monstrous, lonely, instrumental world that asks how and how and how and rejoices every success of the how but rather walk into a dialogic world asking why and inherently needing our fellow humans next to us to answer those whys. Souls demanding us to reimagine life and humankind together. So if the modern human gave up his talent to imagine spiritual together, to speak vision for the many, imagining only for the singular, envisioning the singular for the lack of trust, then this generation's awakening of human to trust comes out of deep loneliness and despair, transcending loneliness and despair every day through a stubborn spiritual intuition that is natural, that we were not doomed to live together, but we were destined to live together. That we could and should share stories, narratives, language, vision. It is the return of the soul to history hearing the existential question of the divine, Ayeka, where are thou? Understanding that the answer, Hineni, here I am, must be spoken in the plural and in some form of unity. Here we all are, all of us, Hinenu. I want to say this gently, and I ask you to please hear my suggestion gently, that this is a moment of tikkun olam, of repair of the world, touching our deepest common stories in a magnificent way. Because I believe that all minorities, but especially women, and especially the gay movement, as I know it here in Israel, a movement of religious men and women fighting to build families, all have a great role in enabling that awakening to happen, with their refusal to accept the paradigm that life is a verdict 
that we were sentenced to live in it, each one for himself or herself in deep loneliness. Both these communities fought for trust, trust in their voice, trust in their ability, trust in their sincerity, trust in their love. They spoke of permission to open a new gate to human partnership. They asked to be accepted to the infrastructure of the world, which is religion, faith, law, thus manifesting more than anything trust in them. In the public space and in the private family and community, they actually did one thing they asked for trust, teaching us that faith in the infinite, in Hashem, in the Kadosh Baruch Hu, in God, cannot be translated to concept of seclusions, but it strives much higher and cannot but speak of a future that brings the many, all many, together, slowly broadening the horizons of our human consciousness so that it could hold within it more and more voices of the infinite. The word emuna, faith in Hebrew, derives from the word imun, to train. It is an ancient training system making way within the soul to humility, to unexpected possibilities, to transparent options that need at least a pinch of holy naivety. It needs a soul naive enough to dream. And so it seems to me, as a Jewish ma'amina, a Jewish believer, like that in this century, what we are witnessing is a miracle, the miracle of souls saving us, of God talking to us, despite all the times we disappear to him. It is a folk movement all around us, which now needs more than anything teachers of faith, more than ever, everywhere. Not politicians, but thousands and thousands of teachers, Christian, Muslim, Jews, who would rekindle the awakening of the soul of humanity. Teachers of trust who create networks of trust, preceding our prophets, Abraham, Moshe, Yeshu, Muhammad, who all dared to formulate a pretentious, vast vision of a shared future. A future in which all forms of life give each other permission to exist, each vouching for the other, broadening the horizons of our human history, turning it into a shared destiny because life without a destiny is like a language without a future tense. It goes nowhere, it inspires nothing, it lacks vision, and the most it can do is to give some temporary comfort. Destiny is the human ability to dream what God sees in us and imagine a life without survival, and that needs trust in ourselves, in God. To me, more than any other tool, the language of trust is the language of prayer. And that should be, I wish, the language of the 21st century. Prayer is a continent of humbleness where the human ability ends and our plea begins. A place wide enough for all dreams to interlace, daring to ask for a common story, transforming together to become one voice of the whole public. I want to say just a few words about Zion, the community from which I come in Yerushalayim, in Jerusalem, which was founded through that very language of prayer, taking a leap of faith into the future, because we understood that we must show our children in Jerusalem, the city who symbolizes the dream of unity, a picture of the future, how we were supposed to do and look in Eretz Israel. That's why we invited Jews from all denominations and all streams to come together. But then we looked and we found partners, great partners and leaders like Father David Neuhaus who sits here today and like Father Rafik and their community. We started meeting and studying regularly. We became good, close friends and partners. We initiated interfaith prayers in the public sphere of Yerushalayim where hundreds of people who have never attended such an event never met each other, Jews who never met Christians, all came together and had a glimpse at the future together. We created a house of prayer called Amen for all faiths 
in the center of Jerusalem, because that is the future, the only future, not surviving by ourselves, for ourselves in a bunker called Judaism or in a bunker called the State of Israel, but cultivating faith together in a holy land dreamed by so many. And we called our community Zion with a deep belief that this is the destiny of Zionism, of Jews, and always has been, that Jews came back to the land of Israel after walking through all cultures and nations and exiles and pain so that we could commit ourselves to humanity as a whole. The return of God in this century is a miracle, a revelation that came upon all of us because we finally see, because we must see, because we yearn to see, and all of us are responsible for it. It is really not a miracle, but a commandment. And so I believe that this is the duty of all of us sitting here today, to raise teachers, teachers of faith, to create a network of teachers of faith, to see ourselves as brothers and sisters who each hold a different angle of one God, to emphasize prayer as a language of oneness, of plea, and to create a meeting house of prayer echoing that amen that we answer to each other's prayers. And so I would like to conclude with the words of Martin Bubil. As far as I know, his last written words from 1965 in Yerushalayim, written in Hebrew, they echo in me every day, and especially here today at your presence, Cardinal Koch. And I want to dedicate it to your leadership, which is very significant to us. I wish that one day every Jew would know exactly what you write and what you do. And we would know much more about each other and meet each other's community. And this is what Martin Bubil writes. And I'll read the whole text because it's too beautiful. He says, no one religion has exclusive hold on absolute truth. Every religion derives from revelation. Every religion is the relation of a certain group of people to the divine. Every religion is a house to the yearning soul of people to God, a house with windows, but with no door, no entrance. And each and every religion is an exile that man was exiled to. Here you are more substantive than anywhere else, different to other groups of people, building a unique interaction with God. Yet in the days to come, days of redemption, we will be released of our exiles and come into the world of God that is shared by all. And in the meantime, those religions who acknowledge that this is our situation can greet each other through their open windows. Moreover, they can create ties between themselves and explore what can be done on their behalf to come closer to redemption. Religions must hear with all their might what God demands of them in this time in history. And in light of this, they must solve the current problems they face in the reality of the world. Thus, they shall become partners in a shared aspiration for a world that has not yet been redeemed. Thank you so much, Rabbi Rosen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Professor Hames, Cardinal Koch, Archbishop Pizzaballa, Bishop Marcuzzo, Monsignor Formica, Father Hoffman, Father David, Father Piotr, um, Rabbi Elad Applebaum, uh, dis distinguished rabbis, professors, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. It's a great honor and pleasure for me to be here today for a number of different reasons. First of all, I've got lots of family associations with this institution. But it's a special honor to be here too for this honorary doctorate to Cardinal Koch. And because in the 30 years of my involvement here in Israel in interfaith relations, I recall well the awarding of this prize that was referred to by Professor Dariel to Cardinal Lechigaray, who actually was not Cardinal Koch's predecessor. He was the president of the Pontifical Council for, for uh, Justice and Peace, but nevertheless was certainly what is, because he's 94 years old and may he be preserved in hell for many more years, definitely one of the great heroes of Catholic Jewish reconciliation. Um, in 
Professor Haim's introduction to the award to Cardinal Koch, he was at pains to explain that the chair or the uh, unit that he heads that deals with the issue of conversion is not trying to proselytize people or to get them to change their uh, f affiliation. And of course, he was therefore understanding, as indeed obviously the institution itself understands, conversion in very much a Jewish perspective, I would say. But in fact, if you are familiar with the Christian world, conversion doesn't mean changing your religion. It means actually precisely what the Jewish word teshuvah means, a return to God. And that's precisely, therefore, its meaning. And there's nothing more dramatic in terms of teshuvah in our times, and maybe even in human history, than actually what we are indirectly, maybe even directly, celebrating here today, which is the incredible transformation in the approach of the Catholic Church towards the Jewish people. Now, I would go so far as to say there's nothing comparable in human history. This is obviously going to sound to you like hyperbole. But think for a moment. Yes, of course, there are attitudes in the world that have changed in different contexts, places, and times. But has there ever been an attitude that sees a particular community, namely the Jewish community, as condemned, rejected by God, even in league with the devil, responsible for the most odious of all crimes in humanity yesterday, and today sees it? as a dearly beloved elder brother of the church, you have the original covenant never broken, that has a relationship with it, as Cardinal Koch said, that is intrinsic to its very identity, that as Pope Francis has reiterated his predecessors, anti-Semitism is a sin against God and man. Can you conceive of anything that is so dramatic? It is the most powerful example of conversion of the spirit in human history. And there's nothing more dramatic in that sense than the return to God or to godliness in terms of the authentic spirit that the church has recaptured than this that directly or indirectly we are celebrating today. Obviously, the subject also conjures up issues that relate to a, a rediscovery of spirituality as it's used today. And now, often that's used in a rather superficial sense. But nevertheless, I still think it's significant. People today talk of, especially in the American context of the Pew study that shows that there are more people with no religious affiliation than ever before. And yet almost the same number indicate that they see themselves as spiritual persons. What does this mean? This means that we have a breakdown in institutional affiliation, but not necessarily of the human spirit. And it is up to the religious institutions to cash in on this remarkable opportunity of our times in which people are genuinely exploring their spiritual direction. If religious institutions do not respond to it, that's their failure, and they risk the consequences. But I would say the presence of the divine returning to human society, broadly even in the Western secular world, is nevertheless very dramatic. Of course, elsewhere we see this return to God in other ways. In Europe, we see it through Muslim immigration, in many ways challenging, therefore, Christian communities or more traditional European societies to have to reevaluate their context and to decide whether they are going to truly be able to promote an identity of substance or not. If identities collapse under the weakness and vacuity, then they deserve to collapse. And if that means the conquest of Islam, then it deserves to conquer it. If the alternative, if one seeks an alternative, then it requires the institutions to work far more seriously on deepening their respective identities. In Israel, we see various forms of renewal of spirituality. We see it within conventional forms of a return to Jewish observance. And once again, there is no cookie cutter here. We're talking about various different phenomena, each of their own order. One we see, especially within the communities of, that are referred to generally under the rubric of Mizrahi, Jews who have come generally from Islamic lands, who very often were divested of their spiritual identity with the best of intentions by a certain secular elite during the first decades of Israel's statehood, who have sought to recapture and regain it very often in manipulative political manners. But nevertheless, it is a reflection of their return, their search for that spirituality. Elsewhere, we see as a result of a certain other secular vacuity, the search for spirituality and the masses that go to the Far East as well as to other parts of the world immediately after military service. In fact, we've got so many there that there's a well-known story of this Indian gentleman who asked an Israeli, how many Jews are you? And he said, well, in, in, how many Israelis are you? And he said, well, we're something like eight million. He said, not here in India. 
So we have, uh, that very often leads to a recovery, a dis discovery of spirituality and often a recovery of their own Jewishness. But not only that, we have various forms of spiritual diversity and creativity in Israel that hadn't existed before. And I think, generally speaking, it's a welcome phenomenon, even if it involves certain syn syncretism and often certain uh, a facile superficiality, it nevertheless is still part and parcel of a genuine search for the divine in people's lives. Let me conclude these just rather superficial um, comments covering such an enormously broad spectrum with references to the return to God in a more destructive way. And that, of course, is the exploitation of the divine for political purposes and even violent ones, which we see in the rise of various uh, extreme forms of extremism disproportionately coming from the Muslim world. In Professor Haim's introduction, he referred to a very significant opponent within uh, religious life. I, too, am not a sociologist, but some of the most interesting works, there are very many interesting works dealing with contemporary religious life, and one of them, one of the most interesting sociologi sociologists in this regard is Douglas Marshall. And Douglas Marshall defines religion as consisting of three Bs, which you can do it in the English language, belief, behavior, and belonging. And religions are different combinations of these in different times and places to greater or lesser degrees. The belonging aspect is a critical one, as Professor Hames highlighted it, and is very much connected, I believe, to much of the violence in the name of religion that we see within our world. People, therefore, seek not only an uh, identity and uh, and stability, a sense of community that is referred to, but they seek a sense of purpose which community gives. And um, identity is inextricably bound up with religion because religion seeks to give meaning to our understanding of who we are as individuals, as members of families, communities, peoples, and therefore to give content and direction to our historical uh, characters. And when identities feel threatened, then inevitably they will insulate themselves and isolate themselves from a wider context. And inevitably, in order for self-justification, tend towards a self-righteousness that tends to be disparaging to those who are outside their own circle and even hostile towards them. And because religion is inextricably bound up with identity, it's bound up with that phenomenon itself. So we see in contexts of conflict or insecurities of various kind, how religion is used as a recourse to bolster those threatened identities, to provide a spiritual self-justification that leads to this abominable self-righteousness and hostility towards others outside the community. Obviously, where there are physical threats to life and limb, there is a need to protect society through the necessary means of self-defense and intelligence. But that's obviously not enough simply to be reactive. We need to be proactive and understand what it is that is leading to this resurgence of the abuse of religion, to this return to God in the most destructive manner and the most dangerous manner. And therefore, it is critically important that we address also this dimension of belonging and understand very interestingly enough, most of the violent individuals who have perpetrated terror acts in Europe are Europeans themselves, of a second or third generation who feel overwhelmingly alienated from their societies. This says something about the challenges that face European and Western society in terms of integration. The need to be able to give people a sense that their identities are welcome and that they can flourish within the broader context in which they live. It's also relevant for our world con World, for our world context, there is therefore much within that violent expression of religion that indicates an alienation from the wider society. In fact, one might even say all violence is an expression of alienation, including domestic violence, and especially national violence. It's a reflection, therefore, of a sense of threat, a sense that they need to defend themselves, a sense that they are somehow unwelcome in the broader world. Obviously, simply to address this dimension alone would be fatuous, disingenuous, and problematic. But it is essential to address that dimension as well. Unless we give people a sense that their belonging, especially their spiritual belonging, is respected and accepted and has a place within the broader societies, the specter and the horror of terrorism in the name of religion will continue to plague us. Thank you.
thank you to all three of our speakers. I actually took, took the uh, topic incredibly seriously, but each one of you took it in a slightly different... Uh, uh, oh, the British understatement. A slight, slightly different uh, uh, trajectory and, and uh, uh, manner. Would anyone of the panelists like to address something that has been said uh, by the other panelists at this stage? No? We, it's, we now have time and we can open up uh, uh, for discussion and uh, uh, questions. Please. Chaim. Uh, thank you for your remarks. I found them interesting, but I'm puzzled. As I understand religious belief, you all religious belief is an absolute belief. I believe that there is a God, and I believe that my way of seeing him is the way. Now, this implies that people who see him in some other way are somehow mistaken. But all of you have, you know, but if this, if my characterization is correct, this implies that when each of you say that we all should come together, we can't really come together completely because we're all coming together with the view, well, he believes he's almost got it right, or she almost got it right, but because she isn't like I am, then there is, must be something wrong with their belief. Now, nobody has said that, because everyone's being diplomatic and politically correct. But the question is, is it possible to really come together? And I'd like the comments of each of you on this one. This is clear. Every humankind and every region has its own way to God because he has a message from God. But when we have a dialogue with one another, we have a wider view of God. And the dialogue is the way to have a wider vision of the religion. And in this sense, it's clear, when we confess we have only one God, it's impossible to have an exclusion, what you have said. And I think just in the, in the, in the Bible, it's very clear in the first chapter of the Genesis, the, the man is the image of God, but not the individual man, is the image of God, but the communion. God said, created the man, man as, um, as image of God, as man and woman created him. Also the relationship between man and woman, is, women is the, uh, the icon of God, the image of God. And it means that we must have a dialogue, we must have relationship and to discuss where is God, who is God, and this is, a, I think, a great enrichment to have a better vision uh, of God. And then we have the community between the different uh, religion and to find a better way to the unity between the Christians, between the different religion and the, between the humankinds in all the world. And I think to have this uh, strong confession of one God is a clear um, challenge to, to find a better communion between one and other. I completely agree. I want to say that I'm married to a mathematician uh, who works on algorithm every day. And one of the things that always amazes me is that there could be an assumption in the world that you could actually grasp something through one algorithm, through one, you know, mathematical process. I think the most beautiful and maybe in a way um, the anchor of faith is that it's not something graspable. You feel the whole ocean in one little drop of rain. 
I think this is the tiring and this is the hopeful work of people of faith. Many times I think that the Bet Midrash of the Jews should actually be expanded as much as we can to all people around the world. We are the rain. We come in all drops, all forms, all around the world. We cannot grasp God. I would even not use the word certainty, certainty, when I speak about God. I think maybe the word is presence everywhere. And sometimes you find it and sometimes not. I actually think that one of the beautiful puzzles of Jewish tradition is that the word El means God. And it, ha it means nothing besides reaching out. You reach out every day, all the time, to something invisible that has a complete presence in different ways in your life. I think for human beings in this era, we think about faith in terminology of success. And I think many times that's our problem. We try to seize faith and see it as a success. I think there's no way to seize God. The only thing is we can at least feel some of the rachamim, some of the mercy, when God touches us as drops of rain, wherever we are. So if you ask me, can we be one? I can't agree with your question. We are one. We are one all the time. What manifests the panoply of what we all are is the fact that each one of us, in a completely uncomprehensible way, has some grasping of the truth. And it's so different from each other. And it's all tied together. And we live in this world in one big mystery in which we try to at least have a glimpse to some of those ties and understand something in them. So I will come to the same conclusion, but I will do it in a far less gracious manner than Rabbi Tamar has done. Um, and I would, if you'll excuse my impertinence, and I certainly don't mean any disrespect, your question really sounds like the classic pre-modern Israeli fixation on absolutes that plays into the dichotomy between religion and secularism that serves the radical secularist and the Haredi in exactly the same way, which is to say, if you're really going to be religious, then you're going to be like that guy with a black hat and the peyote and the nose and funny looking clothes. And because I'm not going to be like such an idiot, you've got to be like me, which is basically to reject the whole thing. The idea that therefore there are subtleties and finding balances and different ways of exploration tends to leave the classical Israeli mindset way behind and beyond its capacity to fathom diversity of spiritual approaches. But that tr truth is that the Jewish approach towards religious experiences in the world has always included a recognition that there is more than simply that within our own tradition. Indeed, it has to. Because our tradition is a tradition born out of the particular experiences of a particular people. It is a religion born out of a particular people and a people born out of a religion. And therefore you can celebrate a value of, of human dignity and that no human being should be oppressed by another which we do at Pesach. But to expect a Hindu or an Eskimo to eat unleavened bread and bitter herbs because somebody else's ancestors came out of Egypt 2,000 years ago or 3,000 years ago, whatever it is. That's what we would call today cultural imperialism. Judaism aspires for universal values and expression, but the forms in which these are experienced and expressed must perforce be diverse because humanity is diverse. Therefore, the conceptions of the divine are diverse. Therefore, anybody who thinks that everything should or could even possibly think the same way or experience the divine the same way is living in cloud cuckoo land. The reality is way beyond the limited conceptions that tend to define that if I would call pre-modern perspective. Yet, as I say, it's been within Judaism historically. The prophet says, What does that mean? That means God is to be found amongst the nations, amongst all the nations of the world. We teach, That's the normative rabbinic approach. There isn't just one way to get to the divine. There are different paths. Rabbi Yehuda Halevi and subsequently others saw precisely Christianity and Islam as ways by bringing the universal messages to humanity that Judaism by its ethnic character definitively cannot. 
therefore there is fundamental partnership in that. We have these same ideas in Natan ibn Fayyumi, one of the greatest minds who is not known well enough within Jewish circles, who sees prophecy expressing itself in the diversity of human culture. We have the approaches of, of Rabbi Moshe Rifkesh, the Be'er HaGoleh, who speaks of the importance of recognizing different perceptions of the divine. And of course, the Yavetz Rabbi Yaakov Emden. Last but not least on my list is Rabbi Shinshan Rafael Hirsch, who goes so far as to not only talk about the Christian-Jewish partnership, but saying there had to be that history of alienation for Christianity to fulfill its destiny within humanity. These are amazing perceptions that are of the authentic expression of Jewish tradition that is not conditioned by the external vulnerability, pain, and alienation that has been part of our history. Unfortunately, Zionism, maybe fortunately, because Zionism would not have been able to succeed if we did not experience that alienation. But it's time to get over that alienation. It's time to wake up, say, Bokerto, we're no longer there in that alien, alien world of where because I affirm one thing, I have to be right and the other has to be wrong. That age should have passed and we should be able to understand the divine as more than any one religion, as Rabbi Tamar quoted uh, Martin Buber. In fact, I would go so far to say, if I didn't dislike the world, I would call it a heresy to suggest that any one tradition can encapsulate the totality of the divine. There must be diverse ways. And that is the beauty of interreligious engagement. Interreligious engagement is important to fight against prejudice and bigotry. If I want to be known and understood, I need to understand and I need to engage the other. It also has to do with shared values. We have fundamental shared values with regards to human dignity, with regards to justice and righteousness. If we really believe in those values, we have an obligation to work with those that share them to be greater than the sum of our different parts. But interreligious engagement is a spiritual experience. It is the experience in which I discover the divine beyond my own tradition and heritage. That's an amazing enrichment. And that's why it's so exciting for me to be involved professionally within this particular area. And it therefore is part of the secret for universal human redemption precisely to be able to recognize that I do not have all the answers, that I cannot by definition encapsulate the totality of the divine, that I must interact with others in order to be able to bring productivity and flourishing to human society. Um. <laughs> I'll, I'll also... Uh, uh... You know that, uh, 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 sitting here at the side, but I, I will uh, um, I'll also point out that uh, as a historian and historians of religion, um, there's never been a time throughout the ages, and I talked about, I mentioned this briefly earlier, but themselves are, are formed through this relation. I mean, many times this, relation has, this relationship hasn't been right, an, an, on equal footings, but it's always, always uh, uh, happened. And I, I happen to think as well, and perhaps I'm, I'm, uh, um, I might be mistaken, but I've always thought that the greatest theological thinkers in, throughout the ages in all of the faiths must have had an element of doubt in order to become as great as they, uh, uh, in order to be able to write what they uh, uh, every wrote. I said, every, I said, every serious religious person. Okay, every serious religious person. Piotr, please. Yes, I have a question to Rav Rosen, but before I ask this question, I would like to mention Mrs. Roxana Omer, uh, who is one of the founders of the Interfaith Initiative in the Negev. This is to say to all the distinguished guests from Jerusalem and, and the broad that I inside the Negev in the south, we do have our own small but yet vivid uh, interreligious dialogue. And uh, uh, Rav uh, Jonathan Sedov that sits here, he is... Uh, uh, he has courage to invite me, a Catholic priest, to preach in his synagogue on Friday evening. So this is happening here in the Negev. And Raf Rosen, you mentioned this dramatic um, change inside the uh, Catholic theology uh, in the attitude towards the Jews. I would like to hear more about such change inside Judaism. And I know you are one of the, the authors of a, of a very important letter signed by more than 70 Orthodox rabbis that say, uh, finally, after so many years, we admit that Christianity is not Abu Zara. It's not blasphemy. Uh, uh, could you mention more such uh, signs of a kind of a change inside Judaism towards Christianity? Thank you. So, uh, thank you. Uh, the, uh, my response is to share both the bad news and the good news. Um, and uh, the bad news is more in Israel than in the diaspora. 
Because by definition, sociology and politics influences theology more than the other way around. And where Jews interact with Christians, the impact of the changes that have taken place within the Christian world are absorbed far more naturally. And in, we need to bear in mind that the vast majority, maybe I would even say 90% of Israelis have never met a modern Christian. Because even, first of all, the local Christian community is overwhelmingly Arab, and therefore victims of the political suspicions and barriers that exist, even if not physically, at least psychologically. When Israelis travel abroad, they tend to meet non-Jews as non-Jews, not as modern Christians. And therefore, the images of Christianity are overwhelmingly taken from the tragic past. So we have a big challenge of overcoming the wounds of the past within Israeli society. But it is happening. Certainly, I think some of the most dramatic factors that contributed to that were the result one of the things, if you'll excuse me boasting, I was very privileged to be part of the little team that negotiated the establishment of diplomatic relations between Israel and the Holy See. That paved the way for the visit of Pope John Paul, St. John Paul II, in the year 2000. That was a dramatic event, because people don't read documents. Most people, as you know, even with the Catholic Church, don't know their own documents. How much more so that the Jews don't know what their documents are. But they watch television, and they saw there the images of the Pope in not only solidarity with Jewish pain at Yad Vashem, but discovering stories of how he saved children during that period, how he, after he was a bishop, restored, baptized children back to their natural parents, and then saw him at the Kotel in respect for Jewish tradition, putting there a text of a prayer for a liturgy of repentance that he had composed that took place two weeks earlier in the Vatican, asking God's forgiveness for the sins committed against Jews down the ages. I mean, that blew Israelis' minds. And even if they forgot it afterwards, something was left within the consciousness that's, that there has been something dramatic that's taken place within this society. One of the other things that when he visited here was an initiative that he took to meet with the chief rabbinate of Israel. And had, at his initiative, there was a meeting with the chief rabbi Zen and the members of the chief rabbinate council. Fortunately, the Pope didn't know exactly what the chief rabbinate was, but nevertheless, as it's the only address of the institution to be able to meet with, it was the only address for him to encounter. And at that meeting, he asked to establish this bilateral commission between the chief rabbinate and the state of Israel, uh, and, the, and the Holy See. And uh, I don't need to tell people in this room, the chief rabbinate of Israel doesn't have a commission for dialogue with other Jews. They never thought of establishing a commission for dialogue with another religion. But when a pope asks you to do it, it's rather difficult to say no. So that's why I often say I am the beneficiary of other people's ignorance and absence. But both with the Israeli foreign ministry and also with the chief rabbinate both turned to me because they don't have anybody there who really knows the difference between a Catholic and a Protestant, let alone between the children of light and the children of darkness. So I'm the beneficiary of other people's ignorance and absence. So as a result, I get involved in do all this wonderful work. But that has been very dramatic because previous chief rabbis and the current chief rabbis and critical individuals, not only those who already at initio were enlightened at the former chair of our bilateral commission, the late Rabbi Shari Ashok Cohen, but people have come from much narrower worlds have been exposed to this new reality and have embraced it. And they talk about the reality within their communities and their multiplicators. So things actually have begun to change through that. The documents you referred to, I mean, uh, in uh, the introduction to Carter Cross Award, uh, I mentioned WMF. WMF is a very important document. Uh, I was one of the signatories, but there were probably maybe 15 of us Orthodox rabbis, the vast majority were reform and conservative. The document you referred to was really historic to do the will of our Father in Heaven, precisely because it came from Orthodox rabbis around the world. But it was an, if you like, an ad hoc, unofficial initiative. What was rather uh, significant was that because of that document, in other words, part of the significance of that document was that the official Orthodox body said, no, we've got to have our document. And that document was released at the end, presented to the Pope at the end of, all, of August. And that's a document endorsed by the Rabbinical Council of America, the Conference of European Rabbis, and the Chief Rabbinate of Israel. That's the first formal endorsement by the Orthodox establishment that not only repudiates any negative imagery of Christianity, but affirms that we are partners for the benefit of humanity. That's an incredible transformation. Now, again, the vast majority of Jews don't even know about it, and certainly not in Israel. But it's nevertheless the beginning of a significant transformation in which you can see more and more understanding that the Catholic Church is no longer the enemy of the Jewish people 
Uh, but in fact, there is a destiny that brings us uniquely together and even a willingness to recognize that there is something of a spiritual and religious significance to that particular relationship. I could go on, but I've gone on long enough. You want to ask a question? Um, so I would like to ask a question which... Uh, um, it perhaps, has perhaps already been touched on in, in the, uh, by members of the, uh, um, the panel, but focuses on how Judaism and Christianity can work, can work together, when in fact, in a way, we're talking about Judaisms and Christianity and Christianities, right? Because there, is, there, is there any way, in other words, is the um, disagreement or agreement between Christianities, between the different streams in Christianities, a block or a, uh, um, or a way forward to bring about greater uh, a dialogue, not just between Christians, but then between Christians and Jews. And the question is the same the other way around. Right? Is the difference between the uh, Jewish denominations, you touched on it just, just uh, uh, before, a stumbling block or uh, something that can actually be used right, in order to enhance the cooperation between, between uh, uh, um, or the dialogue between Jews and Christians? I think we have, first of all, a bilateral dialogue between the Catholic Church and the Jewish uh, community. And we have a very different uh, history and a, a bad history. And in a sense, I must add to what Rabbi Rosen said. First of all, it was the Catholic Church who must make the first pass when we see the history. And then we await the response of the Jewish tradition and the Jewish community of what the Catholic Church have done. And we have patience for this answer. But we are very grateful that we have this answer today of, of Jewish side. I think the dialogue between the different Christian denominations can help. Uh, we cannot have a dialogue between the Christians when we, don't, when we deny the Jewish roots of our common faith. And in this sense, in the different dialogues with other churches, we must have present the dialogue between Christians and Jews. In other say, we have not a, a clear basis, basis and not a clear fundament. But other churches, for instance, the Orthodox, have an, an own dialogue with, with the Jewish community. This is very good. And then we ha can profit from the different views. In this sense, I hope that the, com uh, the Commission for the Religious Relations with the Jews is joined to our Pontifical Council and not to the Pontifical Council of Interreligious Dialogue is a very clear sign that our relationship with the Jews is particular and uh, must be clear. We have this in the beginning of the Second Vatican Coun uh, Council. On the beginning was promised to make a document about Judaism. And then were a great opposite of the Arabic uh, church fathers, council fathers. We cannot uh, uh, go back in our countries when we have only a document about Judaism, we must have a document about Islam. And then was the, the article 4 in Nostra Etate. But when Pope uh, Paul VI founded the commission, he go back to the roots and join the, 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 our commission to the Pontifical Council for, Inter for uh, Christian Unity. And this is a clear challenge that in all um, bilateral dialogues with, uh, with uh, other churches, the dialogue with the Jewish community must be present. And above all, by international um, uh, dialogues, by international uh, greetings and um, uh, gatherings, this must be present, no? because it's the, the roots of our, of our faith. <laughs> um, 
I'm very happy that you asked this question. I want to say that one of the beautiful traditions in Birkot HaShachar, in the uh, blessings of the morning, is that there is a certain group that would stop a few minutes before saying, Baruch Atah, that you, blessed are you, God, that you give me koach, that you give me strength to put on the armor of, and the dressings and the robes of my identity, Malbish Arumim. It sounds as if it talks about the, the you know, the... It, the specific clothes that I'm putting on myself. But that tradition says it's not about the clothes at all, it's about the identity we're carrying. And I want to say that identity, that, we, that identity that we're carrying is substantive. It goes back to what the friends here said about regarding Chaim's question. In every tone you heard it, you heard that we're fighting for the fact that there's something substantive in Jews and substantive in Christian and in Muslims and in every little stream deriving from within those religions. And when we speak about God, we don't speak, at least I do not speak about losing those robes and those garments of substantiveness. On the contrary, I think one of the reasons that this is so fascinating, as Rabbi David said, is that because through that we feel that there is some truth that we are able to touch in this world, at least for a moment, at least receive a glimpse, like I said before. And I think one of the beautiful things that happens in the Bet Midrash, in that house of study in which we learn and meet together, is that we feel what Jews uniquely have to bring to the world, what Christians uniquely have to bring to the world, what Muslims do, do and in a beautiful, proper world which we do not live in, we would see that and help each other make that even more reinforced without hurting each other. I think what happened was that we're so concerned with our fear and so concerned with our survival that we cannot see any of those beauties, not amongst ourselves and not between the different religions. And we live in a sickness that does not enable us to see the present, the gift that we have been received with from God. One of the reasons why in my community, in our community, we meet Christians is because in a beautiful, incredible way, it enables those people to finally be proud of their Jewishness and to feel that they bring a voice to the world that needs to be there and needs to stay. And they look at their neighbor to, in this world and they say, Baruch Hashem, thank God that you're here because through you, I met myself. I could, not, I could see myself, you know, I could lose myself in every root, every corner of this world, when I found you, I could finally understand something within myself. So I just want to say that my prayer right now, besides wanting Rabbi David to be the chief uh, rabbi of Medinat Israel, oh, please don't curse me. <laughs> and besides wanting every Jew in my congregation and anywhere to meet you, I would like this conversation to be heard everywhere we can. And I think at least my feeling is that most of the time we are so defensive, it's not heard anywhere. The media is so defensive, it's not heard anywhere. I would like this prayer to see ourselves through the eyes of the other, to be heard in every synagogue, to have a special prayer in honor of our brothers, in every stream in Christianity, and our brothers in every stream in Islam, to have a prayer for them, not only for our country, but for the world, for our brothers, for our sister, to be able to say it over and over again. So once again, after Rabbi Tamar, there's a sense, I have a sense of coming, Mi'igra Rama Lebira Mikta. So I'm coming from the, these wonderful realms of, of wonderful spirituality to respond to uh, Professor Chaim's question uh, very, in a very much more mundane way. And I think there are, there are many aspects to this important question, but I just want to mention one, and, and thank you for the opportunity because I didn't mention it earlier. And it's a classic example to demonstrate how the dialogue actually with the Catholic Church has provided a vehicle to overcome the nonsense of denominationalism within the Jewish community and the separations. And that's the amazing historical uh, development that took place in the 70s. So long before there was this bilateral commission between the chief rabbinate and the Holy See, Cardinal Koss's commission and Father Norbert Hoffman's uh, commission uh, under Cardinal Koch, uh, there has been since the 70s a formal Jewish partner 
with the Holy See for dialogue, for interreligious uh, consultations. And uh, actually, the name of it is the International Jewish Committee for Interreligious Consultations. Uh, it's actually, I could spend a lot of time explaining to you why it has that name and the background and the internal toings and froings and arguments that exist, but it is the first ever body that was created to presume to represent the Jewish world in interreligious dialogue. And it not only involves all the major diaspora advocacy agencies and has an Israeli constituent as well, but it's the only body, to the best of my knowledge, where official orthodoxy collaborates formally with the reform and the conservative movements. And this miraculous organization, whose acronym is very apposite, called Itch Kick, because being made up of all these organizations, by golly, does it itch and kick. But this organization could not have been created by the Jews. It was created precisely by the dialogue with the Catholic Church. In fact, in, in essence, what happened was the Catholic Church, in so many words, said, dealing with you Jews is giving us multiple, multiple squints. We don't know which ones all you all claiming to represent it, and everybody says, I'm the important address. Get your act together so that we can have a central address to respond to. And for all the Jewish organizations had to be part of this because none of them could afford not to be part of it. Not that they really believe in it, but nevertheless, there was a necessity, force majeure, that brought them together. But as precisely as a result of this dialogue, we have a body where there is a formal interaction between the different denominations of Judaism and probably the only area, to the best of my knowledge, well, matters relate to Israel as well. There are these more secular structures like the President's Conference in America and other bodies where there are also the different denominations involved. But in terms of real cooperation, it's precisely there. And this this is a well-known paradox that within different religions, alternative denominations pose a threat to the more traditional orthodoxy than an encounter with another religion. It's easier for them to encounter another religion than to encounter that diversity within its own particular ranks. So very often it's precisely through the dialogue that we can actually bring the disparate parts within Jewish community to have a greater interaction. So at least there's hope there, though it will take a while. <laughs> Although when, when I have to say that it, you, you sound, you are very optimistic, but when we look at daily reality in, uh, uh, in Israel, and it, it seems that it only stays in the realm of, of uh, dialogue or interfaith, interfaith uh, dialogue and rarely carries over to day-to-day uh, -day, day -day life. And Allow me a brief response to that, just a very brief response. We all know the difference between a pessimist and an optimist. But why does the pessimist see the glass half empty? Why does the optimist see it half full? The pessimist is the unrealistic one. He comes and expects to see a half, the full glass. So he looks down and he sees everything that's missing, so he's disappointed. The optimist comes from underneath, he knows the glass was empty. And therefore he can see everything that's in there, even if it's only halfway, and celebrate it. So it's a matter of perspective. And when you understand what kind of history, what a terrible history we have had. And where we were just only 50 years ago, let alone where we were 80 years ago, and where we are today, how can you but not be an optimist? So yes, we've got a long way to go. But in terms of history, we've come an enormous way. Okay. Yes, please. I would like to, to follow and, and ask all of you, where, where do you think we will be in 50 years? And what are the means to, to get there? I know it's a big question, so feel free to answer briefly. Thank you. I'm not a prophet. <laughs> I'm realistic and optimistic. And I think that we have a good way. And when we can deepen the relation, first of all, the friendship fraternal relations. This is the dialogue of love, of friendship, is the fundament of all theological dialogue. We cannot have theological dialogue when we don't have a clear basis, human basis on, on friendship. When we deepen this, we are able to deepen many questions. And I think we can have a, a good collaboration um, in social questions, political questions, diplomatic questions. But the first of all, I think we have a common witness about the presence of God in the society. This is for me the biggest challenge in the secular situation that we are, because this is a great danger for the, for the humankind. When for the humankind the heaven is closed, he has the challenge to produce the heaven on earth. And we have only three 
um, opportunities to make it. This is the amusement, the work, and the laugh. And it's not the case that many sociologists uh, speaks that the humankind days in, hu in amusement, in work, and in laugh. And in a sense, to open the heaven is, is a, an, an great, uh, a great uh, gift for the humanity. The German um, socialist Gronemeyer uh, uh, has said, the difference of the past and the present is, in the past, the man lived 40 years and in eternity. Today, he lives only 90 years. And this is more or less. Huh? As we have another attitude with the time, when we have a clear uh, view of the, of the eternity and of the absolute dimension uh, of the Almighty, and to give this common witness between Jews and Christians is for me the greatest challenge in our society today. today. And when we give common witness, we come more one another together. At the, at the end, I'll remember. You see that technology and my rabbinate do not work together. But I want to say that I think it has a lot to do with our ability to create a safe and nuanced dialogue. I think a lot, many times about Gan Eden. We say the words Gan Eden as if it were a place. I think it's more of a behavior. Gan is a protected place. It comes from Mugan. And Eden comes from Adinut, gentleness, something that is delicate. We live in a very undelicate world. It, it's through technology, it's through everything. And in order to have a serious, deep conversation with the dignified parts of the, every human being we meet, we need to be able to create a dialogue that has a feeling of safety and a feeling of gentleness. One of the biggest problems is that for many years, many of us have known rabbis who are and a rabbinic notion he, uh, here, as Jews, of something that is very, very, very uh, coarse and does not give place for the dignifying uh, ability to, to have such a discussion, such a conversation. I think we have to raise, it's our duty as Jews to raise a generation of rabbis who give that ability to the, soci to the society in Israel to speak in a, feel, in a field that feels safe and feels delicate and feels nuanced, where people are really invited to speak everything they go through in the journey of the spirit and the journey, the journey of humanity. But the last thing that I want to say is that, and I say this really as a, as a compliment, is that for many generations, and this is one of the tikkun olam I've been speaking about before, the people leading these conversations were men. And I think it's very important and it has much meaning that we're sitting here and I bring and represent the voice of women. One of the tikkun olav in the word of world of interfaith is to make sure that we have different voices around this table and that we have different uh, people and tones trying to bring into the conversation these strings that make the, the human dignity, what we call human dignity. But I think more than anything else, it's courage because this is not the bon ton of where we live today. I think the world we live in today is full of fear. Like you said before, Rabbi David, people use God in order to terrorize others and to, and to accumulate lots of political uh, wealth. And I think that the people who will sacrifice their life in a way to these issues will have to over and over again fight for the dignity of people around them fight to bring in all the voices, fight to make sure that despite the fact that it's a fight, it has to be spoken in a way that gives gun edin, that gives something that is secure and something that is delicate and has time. Uh, wrapping up. Uh, uh, Rabbi Rosen mentioned the uh, fact that uh, politics and sociology are much more powerful in society than uh, faith or uh, theology. And uh, I believe that uh, a lot of the questions have 
touched upon our dissatisfaction with the way things are because of politics and sociology, and not so much because uh, people of good faith can get together and talk together and do all the wonderful things which have been mentioned. Uh, and I was thinking, even before Tamar spoke at the end, uh, that I wanted to mention Women Wage Peace. I want to mention a, a uh, organization created by women, no backing, no financial, no political parties, not, of women that just said, we've had enough. We have to talk to the people we disagree with. And they managed over the past uh, year and a half or so to put together a movement of, I think, 20,000 some women in Israel that had a very wonderful march and, uh, on Jerusalem. And what they did was they took seriously what, what we have been talking about, what you've all been talking about, we've all been talking about in terms of theology, in terms of belief, in terms of philosophy. And they said, you know, you have to put your, this is corporal, corporeal work. It's corporeal faith with your body. You have to put your body in a place which is unfamiliar to you. You have to put your body next to people who are unfamiliar to you. And when you are able to do that, you will then begin to make a, a movement toward an epistemological modesty which enables our, your visions uh, to have some chance in the world. So I don't think that we should, I just wanted to say at the end that we can't ignore the, the, the political side of it, the corporeal side of it. We can't ignore the kind of the, everybody being part of it. And this is what the Women the Wage Peace does, is anybody could join. It was not for leaders, it was not for people with degrees. It was just open to women that wanted to talk to women that they had never met before, never talked to, and they thought of as enemies. We have to dismantle totally the notion that there can be a world without enemies if we just got rid of this group or that group, right? We have to dismantle that totally. And uh, I believe that th all of this is a tremendous contribution, but I think that we also should begin to think about the political, social, corporeal aspect of these ideas so that we can encourage movements uh, from the ground up, so to speak, like Women Wage Peace, as a, uh, I would say a regular feature of society. Uh, thank you very much for that, Rabbi Gretz. I, I would just like to respond to reinforce your comment by uh, giving you an example of how much that impacted. That got very little coverage, relatively speaking, in Israeli media. But I want to tell you about its impact in the Arab world. I've just come back from Morocco, where in Terelia I was the guest of Andrei Azoulay, the most wonderful festival of Andalusian music that takes place every year in Esuera. Esuera is down the coast between um, Casablanca and Agadir. And one time, I swear, uh, the end of the last century was almost 80% Jewish. And it's where the Pinto dynasty comes from, those with a better name of Pinto. We know some with not necessarily the best name of Pinto. And, uh, and every year, this amazing festival takes place, attended by thousands of Moroccan Muslims for the purpose of recapturing the Jewish Arab heritage of Morocco. And there are people there, some of you will know names like... Uh, um, Rabbi Chaim Luk is a permanent feature there this year. Rabbi David Menachem was there for the first time. And they have people coming from Strasbourg as well as the Israeli Andalusian Orchestra and other places in the world. And you have these Muslim Moroccan Arabs singing and clapping and joining in with these Israeli musicians. There was also a combination with Palestinian musicians as well. It was a most wonderful event. It's the second time I've been there. At any rate, uh, sorry, there was a panel. There was a panel on Jewish-Muslim relations that I participated in. And at this panel, Andrei Azoulay, who introduced it, referred specifically to women waging peace. And he said, I know that they don't have a policy. In fact, their policy is not to have a policy so that they can have a bridge growing in. But I want you to know that nothing has done as much for the image of the Jew and of Israel as this movement since the Oslo Agreements. 
So and of it, the impact of it, was, is, its significance is not only for us, its significance is actually globally. And where people see it, they are inspired and hopeful, and I would say less prejudicial as a result. I would like to thank everyone who, is, who has uh, been here today, and uh, especially our uh, panelists, uh, Cardinal Koch, Rabbi Tamar, Apel Applebaum, and uh, uh, Rabbi David uh, uh, Rosen, for agreeing to come here and speak. One of the, when I, I actually uh, um, met Cardinal Koch last year in uh, uh, Rome, and when I offered him, when I asked him whether he would do us the honor of accepting the uh, uh, Ladislao Latz uh, 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 Award, social con uh, ecumenic, Ecumenical and Social Concern uh, uh, Award, I, what I had in my mind was that somehow we would be able, and, and this, your comment just uh, uh, reflected this even more, somehow we would be able to use this occasion to inform Many of, our, many of the people here in, in Israel, just how much has changed in relations between uh, 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 Jews, Jews and Christians over the, uh, uh, over the last 50 years, and also perhaps how that could be used to also create thought within, within uh, 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 the Jewish community. And therefore, my question, my question before as to how we think about our own, our own identities in relation, in relation to the other. In fact, your comment, uh, uh, you said in one of your comments, and I wrote it down, right, we should see ourselves through, through the eyes of the, uh, uh, of the other, and indeed we're going to try and do that tomorrow, because this is not, this is not the end of our uh, uh, um, ceremonies or, or, or visit. We're very grateful to Cardinal Koch that he's agreed to spend another day here, and he'll be with us here uh, uh, tomorrow, and we're going to have a whole... Uh, uh, well, a, a day or a whole program that will deal with Christianity and Judaism through the, right, as the other, but also talking about, again, Christian Jewish relations, and we hope to end the day with actual text study, sitting together and studying, and studying uh, uh, texts which talk about the other, both within the Jewish and in the Christian, uh, uh, from the Jewish and Christian uh, um, points of view. So again, thank you so much for uh, being here. Thank you so much for your uh, opening remarks for the discussion that evolved. Thank you all for listening and asking uh, questions, and we meet again here tomorrow. Thank you.